Chapter Eleven of A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Carlo, San Clemente, California. A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century by Agnes Mary Clark. Recent Comets Continued, Part 2. At Ann Arbor Observatory, Michigan, on July 14th, a comet was discovered by Dr. Chevrolet, which, as his claim to priority is undisputed, is often allowed to bear his name, although designated in strict scientific parlance, Comet 1881 IV. It was observed in Europe after three days, became just discernible by the naked eye at the end of July, and brightened consistently up to its perihelion passage August 22nd, when it was still about fifty million miles from the sun. During many days of that month, the uncommon spectacle was presented of two bright comets circling together, though at widely different distances round the north pole of the heavens. The newcomer, however, never approached the pristine luster of its predecessor. Its nucleus, when brightest, was comparable to the star Cor Caroli, a narrow, perfectly straight ray proceeding from it to a distance of ten degrees. This was easily shown by Bredekin to belong to the hydrogen type of tails, while a strange faint second tail or bifurcation of the first one observed by captain noble august twenty fourth fell into the hydrocarbon class of emanations it was seen august twenty second and twenty fourth by dr f turby of louvain as a short nebulous brush like the abortive beginning of a congeries of curving trains but appeared no more its well-attested presence was significant of the complex constitution of such bodies and the manifold kinds of action progressing in them. The only peculiarity in the spectrum of Chevrolet's comet consisted in the almost total absence of continuous light. The carbon bands were nearly isolated and very bright. Barely from the nucleus proceeded a rainbow-tinted streak indicative of solid or liquid matter which, in this comet, must have been a very scanty amount. Its visit to the sun in 1881 was, so far as is known, the first. The elements of its orbit showed no resemblance to those of any previous comet, nor any marked signs of periodicity, so that, although it may be considered probable, we do not know that it is moving in a closed curve, or will ever again penetrate the precincts of the solar system. It was last seen from the southern hemisphere October 19, 1881. The third of a quartet of lucid comets visible within sixteen months was discovered by Mr. C. S. Wells at the Dudley Observatory, Albany, March 17, 1882. Two days later, it was described by Mr. Louis Baas as a great comet in miniature, so well defined and regularly developed were its various parts and appendages discernible with optical aid early in may it was on june fifth observed on the meridian at albany just before noon an astronomical event of extreme rarity comet wells however never became an object so conspicuous as to attract general attention owing to its immersion in the evening twilight of our northern june but the study of its spectrum revealed new facts of the utmost interest all the comets till then examined had been found, with the two transiently observed exceptions already mentioned, to conform to one invariable type of luminous emission. Individual distinctions there had been, but no specific differences. Now all these bodies had kept at a respectful distance from the sun, for of the great comet of 1880 no spectroscopic inquiries had been made. Comet Wells, on the other hand, approached its surface within little more than five million miles on June 10, 1882, and the vicinity had the effect of developing a novel feature in its incandescence. During the first half of April, its spectrum was of the normal type, though the carbon bands were unusually weak, but with approach to the sun they died out, and the entire light seemed to become concentrated into a narrow, 
unbroken, brilliant streak, hardly to be distinguished from the spectrum of a star. This unusual behavior excited attention, and a strict watch was kept. It was rewarded at the Dunecht Observatory, May 27, by the discernment of what had never before been seen in a comet, the yellow ray of sodium. By June 1st, this had kindled into a blaze overpowering all other emissions. The light of the comet was practically monochromatic, and the image of the entire head, with the root of the tail, could be observed like a solar prominence, depicted in its new saffron vesture of vivid illumination within the jaws of an open slit. At Potsdam, the bright yellow line was perceived with astonishment by Vogel on May 31st, and was next evening identified with Frauenhofer's D. Its character led him to infer a very considerable density in the glowing vapor emitting it. Hasselberg founded an additional argument in favor of the electrical origin of cometary light on the changes in the spectrum of comet wells, for they were closely paralleled by some earlier experiments of Wiedemann in which the gaseous spectra of vacuum tubes were at once effaced on the introduction of metallic vapors. It seemed as if the metal had no sooner been rendered volatile by heat than it usurped the entire office of carrying the discharge, the resulting light being thus exclusively of its production. Had simple incandescence by heat been in question, the effect would have been different. The two spectra would have been superposed without prejudice to either. Similarly, the replacement of the hydrocarbons bands in the spectrum of the comet by the sodium line proved electricity to be the exciting agent, for the increasing thermal power of the sun might, indeed, have ignited the sodium, but it could not have extinguished the hydrocarbons. Sir William Huggins succeeded in photographing the spectrum of comet wells by an exposure of one hour and a quarter. The result was to confirm the novelty of its character. None of the ultraviolet carbon groups were apparent, but certain bright rays, as yet unidentified, had imprinted themselves. Otherwise, the spectrum was strongly continuous, uninterrupted even by the Fraunhofer lines detected in the spectrum of Tebbet's comet. Hence, it was concluded that a smaller proportion of reflected light was mingled with the native emissions of the later arrival. All that is certainly known about the extent of the orbit traversed by the first comet of 1882 is that it came from, and is now retreating towards, vastly remote depths of space. An American computer found a period indicated for it of no less than 400,000 years. A. Thrayen of Dingolstadt arrived at one of 3,617. Both are perhaps equally insecure. We have now to give some brief account of one of the most remarkable cometary apparitions on record, and, with the single exception of that identified with the name of Halley, the most instructive to astronomers. The lessons learned from it were as varied and significant as its aspect was splendid although from the circumstance of its being visible in general only before sunrise the spectators of its splendor were comparatively few the discovery of a great comet at rio janeiro september eleventh eighteen eighty two became known in europe through a telegram from m krulls director of the observatory at that place it had however as appeared subsequently been already seen on the eighth by mr finlay of the cape observatory and at Auckland as early as September 3rd. A later but very singularly conditioned detection, quite unconnected with any of the preceding, was effected by Dr. Common at Ealing. Since the eclipse of May 17th, when a comet, named Tufik, in honor of the Khedive of Egypt, was caught on Dr. Schuster's photographs, entangled, one might almost say, in the outer rays of the corona, he had scrutinized the neighborhood of the sun on the infinitesimal chance of intercepting another such body on its rapid journey thence or thither. We record with wonder that after an interval of exactly four months that infinitesimal chance turned up in his favor. 
on the forenoon of sunday september seventeenth he saw a great comet close to and rapidly approaching the sun it was in fact then within a few hours of perihelion some measures of position were promptly taken but a cloud veil covered the interesting spectacle before midday was long past mr finlay at the cape was more completely fortunate divided from his fellow observer by half the world he unconsciously finished under a clearer sky his interrupted observation the comet of which the silvery radiance contrasted strikingly with the reddish-yellow glare of the sun's margin it drew near to was followed continuously right into the boiling of the limb a circumstance without precedent in cometary history dr elkin who watched the progress of the event with another instrument thought the intrinsic brilliancy of the nucleus scarcely surpassed by that of the sun's surface nevertheless it had no sooner touched it than it vanished as if annihilated so sudden was the disappearance at four hours forty minutes fifty eight seconds cape meantime that the comet was at first believed to have passed behind the sun but this proved not to have been the case the observers at the cape had witnessed a genuine transit nor could non-visibility be explained by equality of luster for the gradations of light on the sun's disk are amply sufficient to bring out against the dusky background of the limb any object matching the brilliancy of the center while an object just equally luminous with the limb must inevitably show dark at the center the only admissible view then is that the bulk of the comet was of too filmy a texture and its presumably solid nucleus too small to intercept any noticeable part of the solar rays a piece of information worth remembering on the following morning the object of this unique observation showed in sir david gill's words an astonishing brilliancy as it rose behind the mountains on the east of table bay and seemed in no way diminished in brightness when the sun rose a few minutes afterward it was only necessary to shade the eye from direct sunlight with the hand at arm's length to see the comet with its brilliant white nucleus and dense white sharply bordered tail of quite half a degree in length all over the world wherever the sky was clear during that day september eighteenth it was obvious to ordinary vision since eighteen forty three nothing had been seen like it from spain italy algeria southern france dispatches came in announcing the extraordinary appearance at cordoba in south america the blazing star near the sun was the one topic of discourse moreover and this is altogether extraordinary the records of its daylight visibility to the naked eye extend over three days at rius near tarragona it showed bright enough to be seen through a passing cloud when only three of the sun's diameters from his limb just before its final rush passed perihelion on september seventeenth while at carthagena in spain on september nineteenth it was kept in view during two hours before and two hours after noon and was similarly visible in algeria on the same day but still more surprising than the appearance of the body itself were the nature and relations of the path it moved in the first rough elements computed for it by mr tebbett dr chandler and mr white assistant at the melbourne observatory showed at once a striking resemblance to those of the twin comets of eighteen forty three and eighteen eighty this suggestive fact became known in this country september twenty seventh through the medium of a dunecht circular it was fully confirmed by subsequent inquiries for which ample opportunities were luckily provided the likeness was not indeed so absolutely perfect as in the previous case it included some slight though real differences but it bore a strong and unmistakable stamp broadly challenging explanation two hypotheses only were really available either the comet of eighteen eighty two was an accelerated return of those of eighteen forty three and eighteen eighty or it was a fragment of an original mass to which they also had belonged for the purposes of the first view the resisting medium was brought into full play 
the opinion of its efficacy was for some time both prevalent and popular and formed the basis moreover of something of a sensational panic for a comet which at a single passage through the sun's atmosphere encountered sufficient resistance to shorten its period from thirty-seven to two years and eight months must in the immediate future be brought to rest on his surface and the solar conflagration thence ensuing was represented in some quarters with more license of imagination than countenance from science as likely to be of catastrophic import to the inhabitants of our little planet but there was a test available in eighteen eighty two which it had not been possible to apply either in eighteen forty three or in eighteen eighty the two bodies visible in those years had been observed only after they had already passed perihelion the third member of the group on the other hand was accurately followed for a week before that event as well as during many months after it finlay's and elkin's observation of its disappearance at the sun's edge formed besides a peculiarly delicate test of its motion the opportunity was thus afforded by directly comparing the comet's velocity before and after its critical plunge through the solar surroundings of ascertaining with approximate certainty whether any considerable retardation had been experienced in the course of that plunge the answer distinctly given was that there had not the computed and observed places on both sides of the sun fitted harmoniously together the effect if any were produced was too small to be perceptible this result is in itself a memorable one it seems to give the coup de grace to Encke's theory discredited in addition by bachlund's investigation of a resisting medium growing rapidly denser inwards for the perihelion distance of the comet of 1882 though somewhat greater than that of its predecessors was nevertheless extremely small it passed at less than three hundred thousand miles of the sun's surface but the ethereal substance long supposed to obstruct the movement of Encke's comet would there be nearly two thousand times denser than at the perihelion of the smaller body and must have exerted a conspicuous retarding influence that none such could be detected seems to argue that no such medium exists further evidence of a decisive kind was not wanting on the question of identity the great september comet of eighteen eighty two was in no hurry to withdraw itself from curious terrestrial scrutiny it was discerned with the naked eye at cordoba as late as march seventh eighteen eighty three and still showed in the field of the great equatorial on june first as an excessively faint whiteness it was then about four hundred and eighty millions of miles from the earth a distance to which no other comet not even excepting the peculiar one of seventeen twenty nine had been pursued moreover an arc of three hundred and forty out of the entire three hundred sixty degrees of its circuit had been described under the eyes of astronomers so that its course came to be very well known that its movement is in a very eccentric ellipse traversed in several hundred years was ascertained the later inquiries of dr kreutz completed in a volume published in nineteen o one demonstrated the period to be of about eight hundred years while that of its predecessor in eighteen forty three might possibly agree with it but is much more probably estimated at five hundred and twelve years the hypothesis that they or any of the comets associated with them were returns of an individual body is peremptorily excluded they may all however have been separated from one original mass by the devalent action of the sun at close quarters each has doubtless its own period since each has most likely suffered retardations or accelerations special to itself which though trifling in amount would avail materially to alter the length of the major axis while leaving the remaining elements of the common orbit virtually unchanged end of recent comets continued part two recording by aaron carlo san clemente california part two chapter eleven part three of a popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Carlo in San Clemente, California. A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century by Agnes Mary Clark. Part 2, Chapter 11, Part 3. Recent Comets Continued. A fifth member was added to the family in 1887. On the 18th of January in that year, M. Tom discovered at Cordoba a comet reproducing with curious fidelity the lineaments of that observed in the same latitudes seven years previously. The narrow ribbon of light, contracting towards the sun and running outward from it to a distance of thirty-five degrees, the unsubstantial head availed the nothingness as it appeared, since no distinct nucleus could be made out. The quick fading into invisibility were all accordant peculiarities, and they were confirmed by some rough calculations of its orbit, showing geometrical affinity to be no less unmistakable than physical likeness. The observations secured were indeed, from the nature of the apparition, neither numerous nor over-reliable, and the earliest of them dated from a week after perihelion, passed almost by a touch-and-go escape, January 11th. On January 27th, this mysterious object could barely be discerned telescopically at Cordoba. That it belonged to the series of southern comets can scarcely be doubted, but the inference that it was an actual return of the comet of 1880 improbable in itself, was negatived by its non-appearance in 1894. Meyer's incorporation with this extraordinary group of the Ellipse Comet of 1882 has been approved by Kreutz after searching examination. The idea of cometary systems was first suggested by Thomas Clausen in 1831. It was developed by the late M. Hook, director of the Utrecht Observatory in 1865 and some following years. He found that in quite a considerable number of cases the paths of two or three comets had a common point of intersection far out in space, indicating with much likelihood a community of origin. This consisted, according to his surmise, in the disruption of a parent mass during its sweep round the star latest visited. Be this as it may, the fact is undoubted that numerous comets fall into groups in which similar conditions of motion betray a pre-existing physical connection. Never before, however, had geometrical relationship been so notorious as between the comets now under consideration and never before, in a comet still, it might be said, in the prime of life, had physical peculiarities tending to account for that affinity been so obvious as in the chief member of the group. Observation of a granular structure in cometary nuclei dates far back into the 17th century, when Caesatus and Hevelius described the central parts of the comets of 1618 and 1652, respectively, as made up of a congeries of minute stars. Analogous symptoms of a loose state of aggregation have of late been not unfrequently detected in telescopic comets, besides the instances of actual division offered by those connected with the names of Biela and Lie. The forces concerned in producing these effects seem to have been peculiarly energetic in the great comet of 1882. The segmentation of the nucleus was first noticed in the United States and at the Cape of Good Hope, September 30th. It proceeded rapidly. At Kiel, on October 5th and 7th, Professor Kruger perceived two centers of condensation. A definite and progressive separation into three masses was observed by Professor Holden, October 13th and 17th. A few days later, M. Temple found the head to consist of four lucid aggregations ranged nearly along the prolongation of the caudal axis, and Dr. Common, January 27, 1883, saw five nuclei in a line like pearls on a string. This remarkable character was preserved to the last moment of the comet's distinct visibility. 
it was a consequence according to dr kreutz of violent interior action in the comet itself while close to the sun there were however other curious proofs of a disaggregative tendency in this body on october ninth schmidt discovered at athens a nebulous object four degrees southwest of the great comet and traveling in the same direction it remained visible for a few days and from oppenheim's and hein's calculations there can be little doubt that it was really the offspring by fission of the body it accompanied this is rendered more probable by the unexampled spectacle offered October 14th to Professor Bernard, then of Nashville, Tennessee, of six or eight distinct cometary masses within six degrees south by west of the comet's head, none of which reappeared on the next opportunity for a search. A week later, however, one similar object was discerned by Mr. W. R. Brooks in the opposite direction from the comet. Thus, space appeared to be strewn with the filmy debris of this beautiful but fragile structure all along the track of its retreat from the sun its tail was only equalled if it were equalled in length by that of the comet of eighteen forty three it extended in space to the vast distance of two hundred millions of miles from the head but so imperfectly were its proportions displayed to terrestrial observers that it at no time covered an arc of the sky of more than thirty degrees this apparent extent was attained during a few days previous to september twenty fifth by a faint thin rigid streak noticed only by a few observers by elkin at the cape observatory eddy at gramstown and cruels at rio janeiro it diverged at a low angle from the denser curved train and was produced according to Bredichin, by the action of a repulsive force twelve times as strong as the counterpull of gravity it belonged that is to type one while the great bifurcate appendage obvious to all eyes corresponded to the lower rate of emission characteristic of type two this was remarkable for the perfect definiteness of its termination for its strongly forked shape and for its unusual permanence down to the end of january eighteen eighty three its length according to schmidt's observations was still ninety three million miles and a week later it remained visible to the naked eye without notable abridgment most singular of all was an anomalous extension of the appendage towards the sun during the greater part of october and november a luminous tube or sheath of prodigious dimensions seemed to surround the head and project in a direction nearly opposite to that of the usual outpourings of attenuated matter c plate three its diameter was computed by schmidt to be october fifteenth no less than four million miles and it was described by cruels as a truncated cone of nebulosity stretching three or four degrees sunwards this and the entire anterior part of the comet were again surrounded by a thin but enormously voluminous paraboloidal envelope observed by schiaparelli for a full month from october nineteenth there can be little doubt that these abnormal effluxes were consequence of the tremendous physical disturbance suffered at perihelion and it is worth remembering that something analogous was observed in the comet of 1680 newtons also noted for its excessively close approach to the sun and possibly moving in a related orbit the only plausible hypothesis as to the mode of their production is that of an opposite state of electrification in the particles composing the ordinary and extraordinary appendages the spectrum of the great comet of 1882 was in part a repetition of that of its immediate predecessor thus confirming the inference that the previously unexampled sodium blaze was in both a direct result of the intense solar action to which they were exposed but the d line was this time not seen alone at dunecht on the morning of september eighteenth doctors copeland and j g loza succeeded in identifying six brilliant rays in the green and yellow with as many prominent iron lines 
a very significant addition to our knowledge of cometary constitution, and one which lent countenance to Bredechin's assumption of various kinds of matter issuing from the nucleus with velocities inversely as their atomic weights. All the lines equally showed a slight displacement, indicating a recession from the earth of the radiating body at the rate of 37 to 46 miles a second. A similar observation made by M. Tollen at Nice on the same day gave emphatic sanction to the spectroscopic method of estimating movement in the line of sight. Before anything was yet known of the comet's path or velocity, he announced, from the position of the double sodium line alone, that at 3 p.m. on September 18th it was increasing its distance from our planet by from 61 to 76 kilometers per second. M. Bigaudin's subsequent calculations showed that its actual swiftness of recession was at that moment 73 kilometers. Changes in the inverse order to those seen in the spectrum of comet wells soon became apparent. In the earlier body, carbon bands had died out with approach to perihelion and had been replaced by sodium emissions. In its successor, sodium emissions became weakened and disappeared with retreat from perihelion and found their substitute in carbon bands. Professor Rico was, in fact, able to infer from the sequence of prismatic phenomena that the comet had already passed the sun, thus establishing a novel criterion for determining the position of a comet in its orbit by the varying quality of its radiations. Recapitulating what was learnt from the five conspicuous comets of 1880-82, to 82, we find that the leading facts acquired to science were these three. First, that comets may be met with pursuing each other, after intervals of many years, in the same or nearly the same track, so that identity of orbit can no longer be regarded as a sure test of individual identity. Secondly, that at least the outer corona may be traversed by such bodies with perfect apparent impunity. Finally, that their chemical constitution is highly complex, and that they possess, in some cases at least, a metallic core resembling the meteoric masses which occasionally reach the Earth from planetary space. A group of five comets, including Halley's, own a sort of clientel dependence upon the planet Neptune. They travel out from the sun just to about his distance from it, as if to pay homage to a powerful protector who gets the credit of their establishment as periodical visitors to the solar system. The second of these bodies to effect a looked-for return was a comet, the sixteenth within ten years, discovered by Pons, July twentieth, 1812, and found by Enke to revolve in an elliptic orbit with a period of nearly seventy-one years. It was not, however, until September 1st, 1883, that Mr. Brooks caught its reappearance. It passed perihelion January 25th, and was last seen January 2nd, 1884. At its brightest, it had the appearance of a second-magnitude star, furnished with a poorly developed double tail, and was fairly conspicuous to the naked eye in southern Europe from December to March. One exceptional feature distinguished it. Its fluctuations in form and luminosity were unprecedented in rapidity and extent. On September 21st, Dr. Chandler observed it at Harvard as a very faint, diffused nebulosity with slight central condensation. On the next night, there was found in its place a bright star of the eighth magnitude scarcely marked out by a bare trace of environing haze from the genuine stars it counterfeited. The change was attended by an eightfold augmentation of light, and was proved by Schiaparelli's confirmatory observations to have been accomplished within a few hours. The stellar disguise was quickly cast aside. The comet appeared on September 23rd as a wide nebulous disk, and soon after faded down to its original dimness. Its distance from the sun was then no less than 200 million miles, and its spectrum showed nothing unusual. These strange variations recurred slightly on October 15th and with marked emphasis on January 1st, when they were witnessed with amazement and 
photometrically studied by Müller of Potsdam. The entire cycle this time was run through in less than four hours, the comet having, in that brief space, condensed with a vivid outburst of light into a seeming star, and the seeming star having expanded back again into a comet. Scarcely less transient, though not altogether similar, changes of aspect were noted by M. Perrotin, January 13 and 19, 1884. On the latter date, the continuous spectrum given by a reddish-yellow disk surrounding the true nucleus seemed intensified by bright knots corresponding to the rays of sodium. A comet discovered by Mr. Sauerthal at the Royal Observatory, Cape of Good Hope, February 19, 1888, distinguished itself by blazing up on May 19th to four or five times its normal brilliancy, at the same time throwing out from the head two lustrous lateral branches. These had, on June 1st, spread backward so as to join the tail with an effect like the playing of a fountain. Ten or eleven days later, they had completely disappeared, leaving the comet in its former shape and insignificance. Its abrupt display of vitality occurred two full months after perihelion. On the morning of July 7, 1889, Mr. W. R. Brooks of Geneva, New York, eminent as a successful comet hunter, secured one of his customary trophies. The faint object in question was moving through the constellation Cetus, and turned out to be a member of Jupiter's numerous family of comets, revolving round the sun in a period of seven years. Its past history came then, to a certain extent, within the scope of investigation, and proved to have been singularly eventful. Nor had the body escaped scatheless from the vicissitudes to which it had been exposed. Observing from Mount Hamilton, August 2nd and 5th, Professor Barnard noticed this comet, 1889 v, to be attended in its progress through space by four outriders. The two brighter companions, the fainter pair survived a very short time, were perfect miniatures, Professor Barnard tells us, of the larger comet, each having a small, fairly defined head and nucleus, with a faint, hazy tail, the more distant one being the larger and less developed. The three comets were in a straight line, nearly east and west, their tails lying along this line. There was no connecting nebulosity between these objects, the tails of the two smaller not reaching each other or the large comet. To all appearance, they were absolutely independent comets. Nevertheless, Spittler at Vienna in the early days of August perceived, as it were, a thin cocoon of nebulosity woven round the entire trio. One of them faded from view September 5th. The other actually outshone the original comet on August 31st, but was plainly of inferior vitality. It was last seen by Bernard on November 25th, with the 36-inch refractor, while its primary afforded an observation for position with the 12-inch, March 20th, 1890. A cause for the disruption it had presumably undergone had, before then, been plausibly assigned. The adventures of Lexel's comet have long served to exemplify the effects of Jupiter's despotic sway over such bodies. Although bright enough in 1770 to be seen with the naked eye, and ascertained to be circulating in five and a half years, it had never previously been seen, and failed subsequently to present itself. The explanation of this anomaly, suggested by Lexel, and fully confirmed by the analytical inquiries both of Laplace and Le Verrier, was that a very close approach to Jupiter in 1767 had completely changed the character of its orbit and brought it within the range of terrestrial observation, while in 1779, after having only twice traversed its new path, at its second return it was so circumstanced as to be invisible from the earth, it was, by a fresh encounter, diverted into one entirely different. Yet the possibility was not lost sight of that the great planet, by inverting its mode of action, might undo its own work and fling the comet once more into the inner part of the solar system. This possibility seemed to be realized by Chandler's identification of Brooks and Lexell's comet. 
an exceedingly close approach to Jupiter in 1886 had, he found reason to believe, produced such extensive alterations in the elements of its motion as to bring the errant body back to our neighborhood in 1889. But his inference, though ratified by Mr. Charles Lane Poor's preliminary calculations, proved dubious on closer inquiry and was rendered wholly inadmissible by the circumstances attending the return of Brooks' Comet in 1896. The companion objects watched by Bernard in 1889 had by that time, perhaps, become dissipated in space, for they were not redetected. They represented in all likelihood wreckage from a collision with Jupiter dating perhaps so far back as 1791, when Mr. Lane Poor found that one of the fateful meetings to which short-period comets are especially subject had taken place. The Lexel Brooks case was almost duplicated by the resemblance to Davico's lost comet of 1844 of one detected November 20th, 1894, by Edward, son of Lewis Swift. Schulhof announced the identity, and Chandler, under reserve, vouched for it. Had the comet continued to pursue the track laboriously laid down for it at Boston, and shown itself at the due epoch in 1900, its individuality might have been considered assured. But the formidable vice-regent of the sun once more interposed, and, in 1897, swept it out of the terrestrial range of view. Hence, the recognition remains ambiguous. On the morning of March 7th, 1892, Professor Lewis Swift discovered the brightest comet that had been seen by northern observers since 1882. About the time of perihelion, which occurred on April 6, it was conspicuous as it crossed the celestial equator from Aquarius towards Pegasus, with a nucleus equal to the third magnitude star and a tail twenty degrees long. This tale was multiple, and multiple in a most curiously variable manner. It divided up into many thin nebulous streaks, the number and relative luster of which underwent rapid and marked changes. Their permanent record on Bernard's and W. H. Pickering's plates marked a noteworthy advance in cometary photography. Plate 4 reproduces two of the Lick pictures taken with a six-inch camera on April 5th and 7th, respectively, with, in each case, an exposure of about one hour. The tail is in the first composed of three main branches, the middle one having sprung out since the previous morning, and the branches are, in their turn, split up into finer rays, to the number of perhaps a dozen in all. In the second, a very different state of things is exhibited. The southern component, Professor Bernard remarked, which was the brightest on the fifth, had become diffused and fainter, while the middle tail was very bright and broad. Its southern side, which was the best defined, was wavy in numerous places, the tail appearing as if disturbing currents were flowing at right angles to it. At forty-two degrees from the head, the tail made an abrupt bend towards the south, as if its current was deflected by some obstacle. In the densest portion of the tail, at the point of deflection, are a couple of dark holes, similar to those seen in some of the nebulae. The middle portion of the tail is brighter, and it looks like crumpled silk in places. Next morning, the southern was the prominent branch, and it was loaded at one degree forty-two minutes from the head with a strange excrescence, suggesting the budding out of a fresh comet in that incongruous situation. Some of these changes, Professor Bernard thought, might possibly be explained by a rotation of the tail on an axis passing through the nucleus, and Pickering, who formed a similar opinion on independent grounds, assigned about ninety-four hours as the period of the gyrating movement. He, moreover, determined accelerative velocities outward from the sun of definite condensations in the tail, indicating for its materials, on Bredichin's theory, a density less than one-half that of hydrogen. This conclusion applied also to Rodam's comet, which exhibited a year later phenomena analogous to those remarked in Swift's. Their photographic study led Professor Hussey 
to significant inferences as to the structure and rapid changes of cometary appendages. Seven comets were detected in 1892, and all, strange to say, were visible together towards the close of the year. Among them was a faint object, which unexpectedly left a trail on a plate exposed by Professor Bernard to the stars in Aquila on October 12th. This was the first comet actually discovered by photography, the Sohag comet having been simultaneously seen and pictured. It has a period of about six years. Holmes's comet is likewise periodical in rather less than seven years. Its path, which is wholly comprised between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, is less eccentric than that of any other known comet. Subsequently to its discovery, on November 6th, it underwent some curious vicissitudes. At first bright and condensed, it expanded rapidly with increasing distance from the sun, to which it had made its nearest approach on June 13th, until, by the middle of December, it was barely discernible with powerful telescopes as a feebly luminous mist on the face of the sky. But on January 6th, 1893, observers in Europe and America were bewildered to find, as if substituted for it, a yellow star of the seventh magnitude, enveloped in a thin nebulous husk, which enclosed a faint miniature tail. This condensation and recovery of light lasted in its full intensity only a couple of days. The almost evanescent faintness of Holmes's comet at its next return accounted for its invisibility previous to 1892, when it was evidently in a state of peculiar excitement. Mr. Perrine was barely able, with the Lick 36-inch, to find the vague nebulous patch which occupied its predicted place on June 10, 1899. The origin of comets has been long and eagerly inquired into, not altogether apart from the cheering guidance of ascertained facts. Sir William Herschel regarded them as fragments of nebulae, scattered debris of embryo worlds, and Laplace approved and adopted the idea. But there was a difficulty. No comet has yet been observed to travel in a decided hyperbola. The typical cometary orbit, apart from disturbance, is parabolic, that is to say, it is indistinguishable from an enormously long ellipse. But this circumstance could only be reconciled with the view that the bodies thus moving were causal visitors from outer space by making, as Laplace did, the tacit assumption that the solar system was at rest. His reasoning was, indeed, thereby completely vitiated, as Gauss pointed out in 1815, and the objections then urged were reiterated by Schiaparelli, who demonstrated in 1871 that a large preponderance of well-marked hyperbolic orbits should result if comets were picked up en route by a swiftly advancing sun. The fact that their native movement is practically parabolic shows it to have been wholly imparted from without. They passively obeyed the pull exerted upon them. In other words, their condition previous to being attracted by the sun was one very nearly of relative repose. They shared, accordingly, the movement of translation through space of the solar system. This significant conclusion had been indicated, on other grounds, as the upshot of researches undertaken independently by Carrington and Mohn in 1860, with a view to ascertaining the anticipated existence of a relationship between the general lie of the paths of comets and the direction of the sun's journey. It is tolerably obvious that if they wandered at haphazard through interstellar regions, their apparitions should markedly aggregate toward the vicinity of the constellation Lyra, that is to say, we should meet considerably more comets than would overtake us, for the very same reason that falling stars are more numerous after than before midnight. Moreover, the comets met by us should be, apparently, swifter moving objects than those coming up with us from behind, because, in the one case, our own real movement would be added to, in the other subtracted from, theirs. But nothing of all this can be detected. Comets approach the sun indifferently from all quarters, 
and with velocities quite independent of direction. We conclude, then, that the cosmical current which bears the solar system towards its unknown goal carries also with it nebulous masses of undefined extent, and at an undefined remoteness, fragments detached from which, continually entering the sphere of the sun's attraction, flit across our skies under the form of comets. These are, however, almost certainly so far strangers to our system that they had no part in the long processes of development by which its present condition was attained. They are, perhaps, survivals of an earlier, and by us scarcely and dimly conceivable state of things, when the swirling chaos from which sun and planets were, by a supreme edict to emerge, had not as yet separately begun to be. End of Part 2, Chapter 11, Part 3, Recent Comets, Continued. Recording by Aaron Carlo in San Clemente, California. Part 2, Chapter 12 of A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio. InterfaceAudio.com. A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century by Agnes Mary Clark. Chapter 12 Stars and Nebulae. That a science of stellar chemistry should not only have become possible, but should already have made material advances, is assuredly one of the most amazing features in the swift progress of knowledge our age has witnessed. Custom can never blunt the wonder with which we must regard the achievement of compelling rays emanating from a source devoid of sensible magnitude through immeasurable distance to reveal by its distinctive qualities the composition of that source the discovery of revolving double stars assured us that the great governing force of the planetary movements and of our own material existence sways equally the courses of the farthest suns in space the application of prismatic analysis certified to the presence in the stars of the familiar materials no less of the earth we tread than of the human bodies built up out of its dust and circumambient vapors we have seen that as early as eighteen twenty three fraunhofer ascertained the generic participation of stellar light in the peculiarity by which sunlight spread out by transmission through a prism shows numerous transverse rulings of interrupting darkness no sooner had Kirchhoff supplied the key to the hidden meaning of those ciphered characters than it was eagerly turned to the interpretation of the dim scrolls unfolded in the spectra of the stars. Donati made at Florence in 1860 the first efforts in this direction, but with little result, owing to the imperfections of the instrumental means at his command. His comparative failure, however, was a prelude to others' success almost simultaneously in eighteen sixty two the novel line of investigation was entered upon by huggins near london by father secchi at rome and by lewis m rutherford in new york fraunhofer's device of using a cylindrical lens for the purpose of giving a second dimension to stellar spectra was adopted by all and was indeed indispensable for a luminous point, such as a star, appears, becomes, when viewed through a prism, a variegated line, which, until broadened into a band by the intervention of a cylindrical lens, is all but useless for purposes of research. This process of rolling out involves, it is true, much loss of light, a scanty and precious commodity as coming from the stars, but the loss is an inevitable one and so fully it is compensated by the great light-grasping power of modern telescopes that important information can now be gained from the spectroscopic examination of stars far below the range of the unarmed eye 
the effective founders of stellar spectroscopy then since rutherford shortly turned his efforts elsewhere were father secchi the eminent jesuit astronomer of the collegio romano where he died february twenty sixth eighteen seventy eight and sir william huggins with whom the late professor w a miller was associated the work of each was happily directed as to supplement that of the other with less perfect appliances the roman astronomer sought to render his extensive rather than precise at tulse hill searching accuracy over a narrow range was aimed at and attained to father secchi is due the merit of having executed the first spectroscopic survey of the heavens above four thousand stars were passed in review by him and classified according to the varying qualities of their light his provisional establishment eighteen sixty three to sixty seven of four types of stellar spectra has proved a genuine aid to knowledge through the facilities afforded by it for the arrangement and comparison of rapidly accumulating facts moreover it is scarcely doubtful that these special distinctions correspond to differences in physical condition of a marked kind the first order comprises more than half the visible and probably an overwhelming proportion of the faintest stars sirius vega regulus altair are amongst its leading members their spectra are distinguished by the breadth and intensity of the four dark bars due to the absorption of hydrogen and by the extreme faintness of the metallic lines of which nevertheless hundreds are disclosed by careful examination the light of these syrian orbs is white or bluish and it is found to be rich in ultraviolet rays capella and arcturus belong to the second or solar type of stars which is about one-sixth less numerously represented than the first. Their spectra are quite closely similar to that of sunlight, in being ruled throughout by innumerable fine dark lines, and they share its yellowish tinge. The third class includes most red and variable stars, commonly synonymous, of which Betelgeuse in the shoulder of Orion and Mira in the whale are noted examples their characteristic spectrum is of the fluted description it shows like a strongly illuminated range of seven or eight variously tinted columns seen in perspective the light falling from the red end towards the violet this kind of absorption is produced by the vapors of metalloids or of compound substances to the fourth order of stars belongs also a collonated spectrum but reversed the light is thrown the other way the three broad zones of absorption which interrupt it are sharp toward the red insensibly gradated towards the violet end the individuals composing class four are few and apparently insignificant the brightest of them not exceeding the fifth magnitude they are commonly distinguished by a deep red tint and gleam like rubies in the field of the telescope father secchi who in 1867 detected the peculiarity of their analyzed light ascribed to it the presence of carbon in some form in their atmospheres and this was confirmed by the researches of h c vogel director of the astrophysical observatory at potsdam the hydrocarbon bands in fact seen bright in comets, are dark in these singular objects the only ones in the heavens save one bright line star and a rare meteor which displays a commentary analogy of the fundamental sort revealed by the spectroscope the numbers of all four orders are however emphatically suns they possess it would appear photospheres radiating all kinds of light and differ from each other mainly in the varying qualities of their absorptive atmospheres the principle that the colors of stars depend not on the intrinsic nature of their light but on the kinds of vapors surrounding them and stopping out certain portions of that light was laid down by huggins in 1864 the phenomena of double stars seems to indicate a connection between the state of the investing atmospheres by the action of which their often brilliantly contrasted tints are produced and their mutual physical relations 
a tabular statement put forward by Professor Holden in June 1880, made it at any rate clear that inequality of magnitude between the components of binary systems accompanies unlikeness in color, and that stars more equally matched in one respect are pretty sure to be so in the other. Besides, blue and green stars of a decided tinge are never solitary. They invariably form part of systems. So that association has undoubtedly a predominant influence upon color. Nevertheless, the crude notion thrown out by Zollner in 1865, that yellow and red stars are simply white stars in various stages of cooling, obtained for a time undeserved currency. Darest, indeed, protested against it, and Angstrom, in 1868, substituted atmospheric quality for mere color, as a criterion of age and temperature. His lead was followed by Lockyer in 1873, and by Vogel in 1874. The scheme of classification due to the Potsdam astrophysicist differed from Father Secchi's only in presenting his third and fourth types as subdivisions of the same order, and inserting three subordinate categories, but their variety was rationalized by the addition of the seductive idea of progressive development. Thus the white Syrian stars were represented as the youngest, because the hottest of the sidereal family, those of the solar pattern as having already wasted much of their store by radiation, and being well advanced in middle life, while the red stars with banded spectra, figured as effete suns, hastening rapidly down the road to final extinction. Vogel's scheme is, however, incomplete. It traces the downward curve of decay, but gives no account of the slow ascent to maturity. The present splendor of Vega, for instance, was prepared, according to all creative analogy, by almost endless processes of gradual change. What was its antecedent condition? The question has been variously answered. Dr. Johnstone Stoney advocated, in 1867, the comparative youth of red stars. A. Ritter of I. La Chapelle divided them in 1883 into two squadrons, posted the one on the ascending, the other on the descending branch of the temperature curve, and corresponding, presumably, with Secchi's third and fourth orders of stars with banded spectra whether in the interim they should display spectra of the Syrian or of the solar type was made to depend on their greater or less massiveness but the revelation actually existing perhaps inverts that contemplated by ritter certainly the evidence collected by mr mondor in eighteen ninety one strongly supports the opinion that the average solar star is a weightier body than the average Syrian star on November 17, 1887, Sir Norman Lockyer communicated to the Royal Society the first of a series of papers embodying his meteoritic hypothesis of cosmical constitution, stated and supported more at large in a separate work bearing that name, published in 1890. The fundamental proposition wrought out in it was that all self-luminous bodies in the celestial space are composed either of swarms of meteorites or of masses of meteoric vapor produced by heat. On the basis of this supposed community of origin, sidereal objects were distributed in seven groups along a temperature curve ascending from nebulae and gaseous or bright line stars, through red stars of the third type and a younger division of solar stars to the high Syrian level then descending through the more strictly solar stars to red stars of the fourth type carbon stars below which lay only the caput maturum entitled group seven the groundwork of this classification was however insecure and has given way certain spectroscopic coincidences avowedly only approximate suggesting that stars in nebulae of every species might be formed out of variously aggregated meteorites failed of verification by exact inquiry and spectroscopic coincidences admit of no compromise those that are merely approximate are as a rule unmeaning in his presidential address at the cardiff meeting of the british association in eighteen ninety one 
dr huggins adhered in the main to the line of advance traced by vogel the inconspicuousness of metallic lines in the spectra of the white stars he attributed not to the paucity but to the high temperature of the vapors producing them and the consequent deficiency of contrast between their absorption rays and the continuous light of photospheric background such a state of things would more probably in his opinion be found in conditions anterior to the solar stage while a considerable cooling of the sun would probably give rise to banded spectra due to compounds he adverted also to the influential effects upon stellar types of varying surface gravity which being a function of both mass and bulk necessarily gains strength with wasting heat and consequent shrinkage the same leading ideas were more fully worked out in an atlas of representative stellar spectra published by sir william and lady huggins in 1899 they were moreover splendidly illustrated by a set of original spectrographic plates while precision was added to the adopted classification by the separation of helium from hydrogen stars the spectrum of the exotic substance terrestrially captured in 1895 is conspicuous by absorption as vogel lockyer and delandres promptly recognized in a considerable number of white stars among them the pleiades and most of the brilliance in orion mr mclean whose valuable spectrographic survey of the heavens was completed at the cape in 1897 found reason to conclude that they are in the first stage of development from gaseous nebulae and in this the tulse hill investigators unhesitantly concur the strongest evidence for the primitive state of white stars is found in their nebular relations the components of groups still involved and entangled with silver braids of cosmic mist show perhaps invariably spectra of the helium type occasionally crossed by bright rays possibly all such stars have passed through a bright line stage but further evidence on the point is needed relative density furnishes another important test of comparative age and syrian stars are on the whole undoubtedly more bulky proportionately to their mass than solar stars the rule however seems to admit of exceptions hence the change from one kind of spectrum to the other is not that inevitably connected with the attainment of a particular degree of condensation there is reason to believe that it is anticipated in the more massive globes despite their comparatively slow cooling as a consequence of the greater power of gravity over their investing vaporous envelopes this conclusion is enforced by the relations of double star spectra the fact that in unequal pairs the chief star most frequently shows a solar its companion a cerium spectrum can scarcely be otherwise explained than by admitting that while the sequence of types is pursued in an invariable order it is pursued much more rapidly in larger than in small orbs it need not indeed be supposed that all stars are identical in constitution and present identical life histories individualities in the one and divergencies in the other must be allowed for yet the main track is plainly continuous and leads by insensible gradations from nebulae through helium stars to the Syrian and onward to the solar type whence by an inevitable transition fluted or antarian spectra develop the first known examples of the class of gaseous stars lyri and cassiopeiae were noticed by father secchi at the outset of his spectroscopic inquiries both show bright lines of hydrogen and helium so that the peculiarity of their condition probably consists in the intense ignition of their chromospheric surroundings the entire radiating surfaces might be described as faculous that is to say brilliant formations such as have been photographed by professor hale on the sun's disk cover perhaps the whole instead of being limited to a small portion of the photospheric area but this state of things is more or less inconstant some at least of the bright rays indicative of it are subject to temporary extinctions 
already in eighteen seventy one to seventy two dr vogel suspected the prevalence of such vicissitudes and their reality was ascertained by m eugene von gothard after the completion of his new astrophysical observatory at herene in the autumn of eighteen eighty one he repeatedly observed the spectra of both stars without perceiving a trace of bright lines and was thus taken quite by surprise when he caught a twinkling of the crimson sea in cassiopeia august thirteenth eighteen eighty three a few days later the whole range including d three was lustrous duly apprised of the recurrence of a phenomenon he had himself vainly looked for during some years m von conkoli took the opportunity of the great vienna refractor being placed at his disposal to examine with it the relighted spectrum on august twenty seventh in its wealth of light c was dazzling d three and the green and blue hydrogen rays shone somewhat less vividly d and the group b showed faintly dark while three broad absorption bands sharply terminated towards the red diffuse towards the violet shaded the spectrum near its opposite extremities the previous absence of bright lines from the spectrum of this star was however by no means so protracted or complete as m von gothard supposed at dunecht c was superbly visible december twentieth eighteen seventy nine f was seen bright on october twenty eighth of the same year and frequently at greenwich in eighteen eighty to eighty one the curious fact has moreover been adverted to by dr copeland that c is much more variable than f to vogel june eighteenth eighteen seventy two the first was invisible while the second was bright at dunecht january eleventh eighteen eighty seven the conditions were so far inverted that c was resplendent f comparatively dim no spectral fluctuations were detected in cassiopeia by keeler in eighteen eighty nine but even with the giant telescope at mount hamilton the helium ray was completely invisible it made nevertheless capricious appearances at south kensington during that autumn and again october twenty first eighteen ninety four while in september of eighteen ninety two belopolsky could obtain no trace of it on orthochromatic plates exposed with the thirty inch polkawa refractor still more noteworthy is the circumstance that the well-known green triplet of magnesium recorded as dark by keeler in eighteen eighty nine came out bright on fifty-two spectrographs of the star taken by father sidgraves during the years eighteen ninety one to ninety nine no fluctuations in the hydrogen spectrum were betrayed by them but subordinate lines of unknown origin showed alternate fading and vivification the spectrum of Lyrae undergoes transitions to some extent analogous, yet involving a different set of considerations. First noticed by von Gothard in 1882, they were imperfectly made out two years later to be of a cyclical character. This, however, could only be effectively determined by photographic means. Beta Lyrae is a short period variable its light changes with great regularity from three point four to four point four magnitude every twelve days and twenty-two hours during which time it attains a twofold maximum with an intervening secondary minimum the question then is of singular interest whether the changes of spectral quality visible in this object correspond to its changes in visual brightness a distinct answer in the affirmative was supplied through mrs fleming's examination of the harvard plates of the star's spectrum upon which in eighteen ninety one she found recorded diverse complex changes of bright and dark lines obviously connected with the phases of luminous variation and obeying in the long run precisely the same period something more will be said presently as to the import of this discovery bright hydrogen lines have so far been detected for the most part photographically at harvard college in about sixty stars including pleione the surmised lost pleiad p cygni noted for instability of light in the seventeenth century and the extraordinary southern variable n carini in most of these objects other vivid rays are associated with those due to hydrogen 
a blaze of hydrogen moreover accompanies the recurring outbursts of about one hundred and fifty long period variables giving banded spectra of the third type professor pickerington discovered the first example of this class towards the close of eighteen eighty six in mira sete further detections were made visually by mr espen and the conjunction of bright hydrogen lines with dusky bands has been proved by mrs fleming's long experience in studying the harvard photographs to indicate unerringly the subjection of the stars thus characterized to variations of luster accomplished in some months a third variety of gaseous star is named after messrs wolf and rayet who discovered at paris in eighteen sixty seven its three typical representatives close together in the constellation cygnus six further specimens were discovered by dr copeland five of them in the course of a trip for the exploration of visual facilities in the andes in eighteen eighty three and a large number have been made known through spectral photographs under professor pickering's direction at the close of the nineteenth century over a hundred such objects had been registered none brighter than the sixth magnitude with the single exception of argus the resplendent continuous spectrum of which first examined by respighi and lockyer in eighteen seventy one is embellished with the yellow and blue rays distinctive of the type here then we have a stellar globe apparently at the highest point of sunlight incandescence sharing the peculiarities of bodies verging toward the nebulous state examined with instruments of adequate power their spectra are seen to be highly complex they include a fairly strong continuous element a numerous set of absorption lines and a range of emission lines more or less completely represented in different stars especially conspicuous is a broad effluence of azure light found by dr vogel in eighteen eighty three and by sir william and lady huggins in eighteen ninety to be of multiple structure and hence to vary in its mode of display its suggested identification with the blue carbon fluting was disproved at tulse hill metallic vapors give no certain sign of their presence in the atmospheres of these remarkable bodies but nebulum is stated to shine in some hydrogen and helium account for a large proportion of their spectral rays thirty-two wolf rayet stars were investigated spectroscopically and spectrographically by professor campbell with the great lick refractor in eighteen ninety two to ninety four and several disclosed the singularity already noticed by him in argus of giving out mixed series the members of which change from vivid to obscure with increase of refrangibility it is difficult to imagine by what chromospheric machinery this curious result can be produced alcyon in the pleiades presents the same characteristic alone among the hydrogen lines crimson sea glows in its spectrum while all others are dark luminosity of the wolf rayet kind is particularly constant both in quantity and quality it seems to be incapable of developing save under galactic conditions all the stars marked by it lie near the central line of the milky way or in the magellanic clouds they tend also to gather into groups circles of four degrees radius include respectively seven in argo eight in cygnus the first spectroscopic star catalogue was published by dr vogel in potsdam in eighteen eighty three it included four thousand and fifty one stars distributed over a zone of the heavens extending from twenty degrees north to twenty degrees south of the celestial equator more than half of these were white stars while red stars with banded spectra occurred in the proportion of about one-thirteenth of the whole to the latter genus m Dunaire, then of lund now director of the upsala observatory devoted a work of standard authority issued at stockholm in eighteen eighty four this was a catalogue with descriptive particulars of three hundred and fifty two stars showing banded spectra two hundred and ninety seven of which belonged to Seti's third fifty-five to his fourth class vogel's third a and three b 
since then discovery has progressed so rapidly at first through the telescopic reviews of mr espen then in the course of the photographic survey carried on at harvard college that considerably over one thousand stars are at present recognized as of the family of betelgeuse and mira while about two hundred and fifty have so far exhibited the spectral pattern of nineteen piscium one fact well ascertained as regards both species is the invariability of the type the prismatic flutings of the one and the broader zones of the other are as if stereotyped they undergo in their fundamental outlines no modification though varying in relative intensity from star to star they are always accompanied by or superposed upon a spectrum of dark lines in producing which sodium and iron have an obvious share and certain bright rays noticed by secchi with his imperfect appliances as enhancing the chiaroscuro effects in carbon stars came out upon plates exposed by hale and ellerman in eighteen ninety eight with the stellar spectrograph of the yerkes observatory their genuineness was shortly afterwards visually attested by keeler campbell and dunay but no chemical interpretation has been found for them end of section thirty six recording by lawrence trask mount vernon ohio interface audio dot com part two chapter twelve part two of a popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century by mary agnes clark chapter twelve stars and nebulae part two a fairly complete preliminary answer to the question what are the stars made of was given by sir william huggins in eighteen sixty four by laborious processes of comparison between stellar dark lines and the bright rays emitted by terrestrial substances he sought to assure his conclusions regardless of cost in time and pains he averred indeed that taking into account restrictions by weather and position the thorough investigation of a single star spectrum would be the work of some years of two however those of betelgeuse and alderbaran he was able to furnish detailed and accurate drawings the dusky flutings in the prismatic light of the first of these stars have not been identified with the absorption of any particular substance but associated with them are metallic lines of which seventy-eight were measured and a good many identified by huggins while the wavelengths of ninety-seven were determined by vogel in eighteen seventy one a photographic research made by keeler at the allegheny observatory in eighteen ninety seven convinced him that the linear spectrum of third type stars of the betelgeuse pattern essentially repeats that of the sun but with marked differences in the comparative strength of its components hydrogen rays are inconspicuously present that an exalted temperature reigns at least in the lower strata of the atmosphere is certified by the vaporization there of matter so refractory to heat as iron nine elements among them iron sodium calcium and magnesium were recognized by huggins as having stamped their signature on the spectrum of alderbaran while the existence in sirius and nearly all the other stars inspected of hydrogen together with sundry metals was rendered certain or highly probable this was admitted to be a bare gleaning of results nor is there reason to suppose any of his congeners inferior to our sun in complexity of constitution definite knowledge on the subject however made little advance beyond the point to which it was brought by huggins's early experiments until spectroscopic photography became thoroughly effective as a means of research 
in this as in so many other directions sir william huggins acted as pioneer in march eighteen sixty three he obtained microscopic prints of the spectra of sirius and capella but they told nothing no lines were visible in them they were mere characterless streaks of light nine years later dr henry draper of new york got an impression of four lines in the spectrum of vega then huggins attacked the subject again in eighteen seventy six when the eighteen inch speculum of the royal society had come into his possession using prisms of iceland spar and lenses of rock crystal and this time with better success a photograph of the spectrum of vega showed seven strong lines still he was not satisfied he waited and worked for three years longer at length on december eighteen eighteen seventy nine he was able to communicate to the royal society results answering to his expectations the delicacy of eye and hand needed to obtain them may be estimated from the single fact that the image of a star had to be kept by continual minute adjustments exactly projected upon a slit one over three hundred and fifty of an inch in width during nearly an hour in order to give it time to imprint the characters of its analyzed light upon a gelatine plate raised to the highest pitch of sensitiveness but by this time he had secured in his wife a rarely qualified assistant the altered violet spectrum of the white stars of which vega was taken as the type was thus shown to be a very remarkable one a group of broad dark lines intersected it arranged at intervals diminishing regularly upward and falling into a rhythmical succession with the visible hydrogen lines all belonged presumably to the same substance and the presumption was rendered a certainty by direct photographs of the hydrogen spectrum taken by h w vogel at berlin a few months earlier in them seven of the white star series of grouped lines were visible and the full complement of twelve appeared on cornu's plates in eighteen eighty six in yellow stars such as capella and arcturus the same rhythmical series was partially represented but associated with a great number of other lines their state as regards ultraviolet absorption approximating to that of the sun while the redder stars betrayed so marked a deficiency in actinic rays that from betelgeuse with an exposure forty times that required for sirius only a faint spectral impression could be obtained and from aldebaran in the strictly invisible region almost none at all thus by the means of stellar light analysis acquaintance was first made with the ultraviolet spectrum of hydrogen and its harmonic character as expressed by balmer's law supplies a sure test for discriminating among newly discovered lines those that appertain from those that are unrelated to it delandre's five additional prominence rays for instance were at once seen to make part of the series because conforming to its law while a group of six dusky bands photographed by sir william and lady huggins april fourth eighteen ninety near the extreme upper end of the spectrum of sirius were pronounced without hesitation for the opposite reason to have nothing to do with hydrogen their true affinities are still a matter for inquiry as regards the hydrogen spectrum however the stars had further information in reserve until recently it was supposed to consist of a single harmonic series although by analogy three should coexist in eighteen ninety six accordingly a second bound to the first by unmistakable numerical relationships was recognized by professor pickering in spectrographs of the two point five magnitude star zeta pupus and the identification was shortly afterwards extended to prominent wolf rayet emission lines the discovery was capped by dr rydberg's indication of the wolf rayet blue band at lambda four thousand six hundred eighty eight as the fundamental member of the third and principal hydrogen series none of the pickering lines as they may be called to distinguish them from the huggins series can be induced to glimmer in vacuum tubes they seem to characterize bodies in a primitive state and are in many cases associated with absorption rays of oxygen the identification of which by mr mclean in eighteen ninety seven was fully confirmed by sir david gill 
the typical oxygen star is beta crucis one of the brilliants of the southern cross but the distinctive notes of its spectrum occur in not a few specimens of the helium class thus sir william and lady huggins photographed several ultraviolet oxygen lines in beta lyri and found in rigel signs of the presence of nitrogen which as well as silicium proves to be a tolerably frequent constituent of such orbs for some unknown reason metalloids tend to become effaced as metals in the normal course of stellar development exert a more and more conspicuous action dr schneider's spectrographic researches at potsdam in eighteen ninety and subsequently exemplify the immense advantages of self-registration in a restricted section of the spectrum of capella he was enabled to determine nearly three hundred lines with more precision than had then been attained in the measurement of terrestrial spectra this star appeared to be virtually identical with the sun in physical constitution although it emits according to the best available data about one hundred and forty times as much light and is hence presumably one thousand six hundred times more voluminous an equally close examination of the spectrum of betelgeuse showed the predominance in it of the linear absorption of iron but its characteristic flutings do not extend to the photographic region spectra of the second and third orders are for this reason not easily distinguished on the sensitive plate a spectrographic investigation of all the brighter northern stars was set on foot in eighteen eighty six at the observatory of harvard college under the form of a memorial to dr h draper whose promising work in that line was brought to a close by his premature death in eighteen eighty two no individual exertions could however have realized a tithe of what has been and is being accomplished under professor pickering's able direction with the aid of the draper and other instruments supplemented by mrs draper's liberal provision of funds a novel system was adopted or rather an old one originally used by fraunhofer was revived the use of a slit was discarded as unnecessary for objects like the stars devoid of sensible dimensions and giving hence a naturally pure spectrum and a large prism placed in front of the object glass analyzed at once with slight loss of light the rays of all the stars in the field their spectra were taken as it were wholesale as many as two hundred stars down to the eighth magnitude were occasionally printed on a single plate with a single exposure no cylindrical lens was employed the movement of the stars themselves was turned to account for giving the desirable width to their spectra the star was allowed by disconnecting or suitably regulating the clock to travel slowly across the line of its own dispersed light so broadening it gradually into a band excellent results were secured in this way about fifty lines appear in the photographed spectrum of aldebaran and eight in that of vega on january twenty sixth eighteen eighty six an exposure of thirty-four minutes a simultaneous impression was obtained of the spectra among many others of close upon forty pleiades with few and doubtful exceptions they all proved to belong to the same type an additional argument for the common origin of the stars forming this beautiful group was thus provided the draper catalogue of stellar spectra was published in eighteen ninety it gives the results of a rapid analytical survey of the heavens north of twenty five degrees of southern declination and includes ten thousand three hundred and fifty one stars down to about the eighth magnitude the telescope used was of eight inches aperture and forty five focus its field of view owing to the portrait lens or doublet form given to it embracing with fair definition no less than one hundred square degrees an objective prism eight inches square was attached and exposures of a few minutes were given to the most sensitive plates that could be procured in this way the sky was twice covered in duplicate each star appearing as a rule on four plates the registration of their spectra was sought to be made more distinctive than had previously been attempted secchi's first type being divided into four his second into five subdivisions but the differences regarded in them could be confidently established only for stars above the sixth magnitude
the work supplies none the less valuable materials for general inferences as to the distribution and relations of the spectral types the labour of its actual preparation was borne by a staff of ladies under the direction of mrs fleming materials for its completion to the southern pole have been accumulated with the identical instrument used at cambridge transferred for the purpose in eighteen ninety nine to peru and the forthcoming second draper catalogue will comprise thirty thousand stars in both hemispheres as supplements to this great enterprise two important detailed discussions of stellar spectra were issued in eighteen ninety seven and nineteen o one respectively the first by miss a c maury dealt with six hundred and eighty one bright stars visible in the northern hemisphere the second by miss a j cannon with one thousand one hundred and twenty two southern stars both authors traced with care and ability the minute gradations by which the long process of stellar evolution appears to be accomplished the progress of the draper memorial researches was marked by discoveries of an unexampled kind the principle upon which motion in the line of sight can be detected and measured with the spectroscope has already been explained it depends as our readers will remember upon the removal of certain lines dark or bright it matters not which from their normal places by almost infinitesimal amounts the whole spectrum of the moving object in fact is very slightly shoved hither or thither according as it is travelling towards or from the eye but for convenience of measurement one line is usually picked out from the rest and attention concentrated upon it the application of this method to the stars however is encompassed with difficulties it needs a powerfully dispersive spectroscope to show line displacements of the minute order in question and powerful dispersion involves a strictly proportionate enfeeblement of light this where the supply is already to a deplorable extent niggardly can ill be afforded for which reason the operation of determining a star's approach or recession is even apart from atmospheric obstacles an excessively delicate one it was first executed by sir william huggins early in eighteen sixty eight selecting the brightest star in the heavens as the most promising subject of experiment he considered the f line in the spectrum of sirius to be just so much displaced towards the red as to indicate the orbital motion of the earth being deducted recession at the rate of twenty nine miles a second and the reality and direction of the movement were ratified by vogel and losse's observation march twenty two eighteen seventy one of a similar but even more considerable displacement the inquiry was resumed by huggins with improved apparatus in the following year when the velocities of thirty stars were approximately determined the retreat of sirius which proved slower than had at first been supposed was now announced to be shared at rates varying from twelve to twenty nine miles by betelgeuse rigel castor regulus and five of the principal stars in the plough arcturus on the contrary gave signs of rapid approach as well as pollux vega deneb in the swan and the brightness of the pointers numerically indeed these results were encompassed with uncertainty thus arcturus is now fully ascertained to be travelling towards the sun at the comparatively slow pace of less than five miles a second and sirius moves twice as fast in the same direction the great difficulty of measuring so distended a line as the syrian f might indeed well account for some apparent anomalies the scope of sir william huggins's achievement was not however to provide definitive data but to establish as practicable the method of procuring them in this he was thoroughly successful and his success was of incalculable value spectroscopic investigations of stellar movements may confidently be expected to play a leading part in the unravelment of the vast and complex relations which we can dimly detect as prevailing among the innumerable orbs of the sidereal world for it supplements the means which we possess of measuring by direct observation movements transverse to the line of sight and thus completes our knowledge of the course 
courses and velocities of stars at ascertained distances while supplying for all a valuable index to the amount of perspective foreshortening of apparent movement thus some even if an imperfect knowledge may at length be gained of the revolutions of the stars of the systems they unite to form of the paths they respectively pursue and of the forces under the compulsion of which they travel the applicability of the method to determining the orbital motions of double stars was pointed out by fox talbot in eighteen seventy one but its use for their discovery revealed itself spontaneously through the harvard college photographs in spectrograms of ursa majoris mizar taken in eighteen eighty seven and again in eighteen eighty nine the k line was seen to be double while on other plates it appeared single a careful study of miss a c maury of a series of seventy impressions indicated for the doubling a period of fifty-two days and showed it to affect all the lines in the spectrum the only available and no doubt the true explanation of the phenomenon was that two similar and nearly equal stars are here merged into one telescopically indivisible their combined light giving a single or double spectrum according as their orbital velocities are directed across or along our line of sight the movements of a revolving pair of stars must always be opposite in sense and proportionately equal in amount that is they all at times travel with speeds in the inverse ratio of their masses hence unless the plane of their orbits be perpendicular to a plane passing through the eye there must be two opposite points where their velocities in the line of sight reach a maximum and two diametrically opposite points where they touch zero the lines in their common spectrum would thus appear alternately double and single twice in the course of each revolution to that of mazar at first supposed to need one hundred and four days for its completion a period of only twenty days fourteen hours was finally assigned by vogel anomalous spectral effects probably due to the very considerable eccentricity of the orbit long impeded its satisfactory determination the mean distance apart of the component stars as now ascertained is just twenty two million miles and their joint mass quadruples that of the sun but these are minimum estimates for if the orbital plane be inclined much or little to the line of sight the dimensions and mass of the system should be proportionately increased an analogous discovery was made by miss maury in eighteen eighty nine but in the spectrum of beta aurigae the lines open out and close up on alternate days indicating a relative orbit with a radius of less than eight million miles traversed in about four days this implies a rate of travel for each star of sixty five miles a second and a combined mass four point seven times that of the sun the components are approximately equal both in mass and light and the system formed by them is transported towards us with a speed of some sixty miles a second the line shifting so singularly communicative proceed in this star with perfect regularity this new class of spectroscopic binaries could never have been visually disclosed the distance of beta aurigae from the earth as determined somewhat doubtfully by professor pritchard is nearly three and a third million times that of the earth from the sun parallax equals zero point zero six minutes whence it has been calculated that the greatest angular separation of the revolving stars is only five thousandths of a second of arc to make this evanescent interval perceptible a telescope eighty feet in aperture would be required the zodiacal star spisa alpha were genus was announced by dr vogel april twenty four eighteen ninety to belong to the novel category with the difference however of possessing a nearly dark instead of a brilliantly lustrous companion in this case accordingly the tell-tale spectroscopic variations consist merely in a slight swinging to and fro of single lines no second spectrum leaves a legible trace on the plate 
spice revolves in four days at the rate of fifty seven miles a second or quicker in proportion as its orbit is more inclined to the line of sight round a centre at a minimum distance of three millions of miles but the position of the second star being unknown the mass of the system remains indeterminate the lesser component of the splendid slowly revolving binary castor is also closely double its spectral lines were found by beliposky in eighteen ninety six to oscillate once in nearly three days the secondary globe being apparently quite obscure further study of the movements thus betrayed elicited the fact that the major axis of the eclipse traversed revolves in a period of two thousand one hundred days as a consequence most likely of the flattened shape of the stars still more unexpected was the simultaneous assignment by campbell and newell of a duplex character to capella here both components shine though with a different quality of light one giving a pure solar spectrum the other claiming prismatic affinity with procyon their mutual circulation is performed in one hundred and four days and the radius of their orbit cannot be less and may be a great deal more than fifty one million miles hence the possibility is not excluded that the star which has an authentic parallax of zero point zero eight minutes may be visually resolved indeed signs of elongation were thought to be perceptible with the greenwich twenty eight inch refractor while only round images could be seen at lick another noteworthy case is that of polaris found by campbell to have certainly one and probably two obscure attendants through his systematic investigations of stellar radial velocities with the mills spectrograph knowledge in this department has since eighteen ninety seven progressed so rapidly that the spectroscopic binaries of our acquaintance already number half a hundred and ten times as many more doubtless lie within easy range of detection now it is evident that a spectroscopic binary if the plane of its motion made a very small angle with the line of sight would be a variable star for during a few hours of each revolution some at least of its light should be cut off by a transit of its dusky companion such eclipse stars are actually found in the heavens the best and longest known member of the group is algol in the head of medusa the demon star of the arabs this remarkable object normally above the third magnitude loses and regains three-fifths of its light once in sixty-eight point eight hours the change being completed in about twelve hours its definite and limited nature and punctual recurrence suggested to goodrick of york by whom the periodicity of the star was discovered in seventeen eighty three the interposition of a large dark satellite but the conditions involved by the explanation were first seriously investigated by pickering in eighteen eighty he found that the phenomena could be satisfactorily accounted for by supposing an obscure body zero point seven six four the bright star's diameter to revolve round it in a period identical with that of its observed variation this theoretical forecast was verified with singular exactitude at potsdam in eighteen eighty nine a series of spectral photographs taken there showed each of algol's minima to be preceded by a rapid recession from the earth and succeeded by a rapid movement of approach towards it they take place accordingly when the star is at the furthest point from ourselves of an orbit described round an invisible companion the transits of which across its disk betray themselves to notice by the luminous vicissitudes they occasion the diameter of this orbit traversed at the rate of twenty six miles a second is just two million miles and it is an easy further inference from the duration and extent of the phases exhibited that algol itself must be in round numbers one million its attendant eight hundred and thirty thousand miles in diameter assuming both to be of the same density vogel found their respective masses to be four ninths and two ninths that of the sun and their distance ascended to be three million two hundred and thirty thousand miles 
this singularly assorted pair of stars possibly form part of a larger system their period of revolution is shorter now by six seconds than it was in goodrick's time and dr chandler has shown by an exhaustive discussion that its inequalities are comprised in a cycle of about one hundred and thirty years they arise in his view from a common revolution in that period of the close couple about a third distant body emitting little or no light in an orbit inclined twenty degrees to our line of vision and of approximately the size of that described by uranus round the sun the time spent by light in crossing this orbit causes an apparent delay in the phases of the variable when algol and its eclipsing satellite are on its further side from ourselves balanced by acceleration while they traverse its hither side dr chandler derives confirmation for his plausible and ingenious theory from a supposed undulation in the line traced out by algol's small proper motion but the reality of this disturbance has yet to be established meanwhile m tisserand late director of the paris observatory preferred to account for algol's inequalities on the principle later applied by belopolsky to those of castor that is to say he assumed a revolving line of apsides in an elliptical orbit traversed by a pretty strongly compressed pair of globes the truth of this hypothesis can be tested by close observation of the phases of the star during the next few years the variable in the head of medusa is the exemplar of a class including twenty-six recognized members all of which doubtless represent occulting combinations of stars but their occultations result merely from the accident of their orbital planes passing through our line of sight hence the heavens must contain numerous systems similarly constituted though otherwise situated as regards ourselves some of which like spisa where genus will become known through their spectroscopic changes while others because revolving in planes nearly tangent to the sphere or at right angles to the visual line may never disclose to us their true nature among eclipsing stars should probably be reckoned the peculiar variables beta lyri and v puppis each believed to consist of a pair of bright stars revolving almost in contact three stars on the other hand distinguished by rapid and regular fluctuations have been proved by belopolsky to be attended by non-occulting satellites which circulate nevertheless in the identical periods of light change gore's catalogue of known variables included in eighteen eighty four one hundred and ninety entries and the number was augmented to two hundred and forty three on its revision in eighteen eighty eight chandler's first list of two hundred and twenty five such objects published about the same time received successive expansions in eighteen ninety three and eighteen ninety six and finally included four hundred entries a new catalogue of variable stars still wider in scope will shortly be issued by the german astronomische Gesellschaft mr a w roberts's researches on southern variables have greatly helped to give precision while adding to the extent of knowledge in this branch dr gould held the opinion that most stars fluctuate slightly in brightness through surface alterations similar to but on a larger scale than those of the sun and the solar analogy might be pushed somewhat further it perhaps affords a clue to much that is perplexing in stellar behaviour wolf pointed out in eighteen fifty two the striking resemblance in character between curves representing sun-spot frequency and curves representing the changing luminous intensity of many variable stars there were the same steep ascent to maximum and more gradual decline to minimum the same irregularities in heights and hollows and it may be added the same tendency to a double maximum and complexity of superposed periods it is impossible to compare the two sets of phenomena thus graphically portrayed without reaching the conclusion that they are of closely related origin but the correspondence indicated is not as has often been hastily assumed between maxima of some spots and minima of stellar brightness but just the reverse 
the luminous outbursts not the obscurations of variable stars obey a law analogous to that governing the development of spots on the sun objects of the kind do not then gain light through the closing up of dusky chasms in their photospheres but by an actual increase of surface brilliancy together with an immense growth of these brilliant formations prominences and faculae which in the sun accompany or are appended to spots a comparison of light curves with curves of spot frequency leaves no doubt on this point and the strongest corroborative evidence is derived from the emergence of bright lines in the spectra of long period variables rising to their recurring maxima End of chapter twelve part two